Welcome to What the Fuck Biology. Here we explore the lesser known and underappreciated strangeness that exists in the world around us. I'm your host, Julia Hole, PhD candidate in biology and ecology. Today we will discuss a host swapping alien invader that's wreaking havoc in the forests of North America. Joining me today is postdoctoral scholar at the University of Idaho, musician and all around great guy, Dr. Aaron Muller. Thank you for joining me, Aaron. And let's just go ahead and get into it. Will you tell me a little bit about your background, your education, um, how you became interested in science? Sure, Julia. Yeah, happy to be here. So I grew up in Michigan and Metro Detroit. I was very lucky um, to have grown up in an area of Metro Detroit that had a lot of forested areas because it's not really the case there usually. So I, I grew up exposed to, you know, nature a whole lot. And I imagine that, you know, the route that I chose to become a biologist has a lot to do with, with that early exposure. And so fast forward many years past that childhood exposed to nature, and I ended up doing a undergraduate degree, a bachelor of science in agroecology at the University of Idaho. Uh, I grew interested in the ecology side of that and did a master's in biology focusing on plant and fungal ecology at Idaho State University. And then I did a PhD in biology at Northern Arizona University studying evolutionary ecology of Southwestern white pine. That's fantastic. Is there any particular reason why pine specifically that, that caught your interest? Yeah. Okay. So I guess I have to note that I was always obsessed with climbing mountains as a kid. I grew up in Michigan, but I had family out West in Montana and um, we, did some mountain climbing as a, a kid, and I noticed these scrubby, funky little bonsai looking trees at the tops of mountains. And ever since then, basically, let's say 30 years um, now, I've been fascinated with how organisms can withstand the elements at high elevation, especially when it you know, tortures them into these funky shapes like little bonsai trees. And, and uh, yeah, so I think partly the aesthetics of that environment, trying to find a way to go to those environments for my income, right? Like doing something for a living that lets me go play outside. All of those just kind of came together with a focus um, on pines in my early research for like my master's because I, I found that I was able to have a lot of fun and go to cool places and still do science. Yeah, that's awesome. I found that as a scientist, I get to do, I get paid to do the same thing that I did when I was seven, which is play in the dirt. So it sounds like you found yourself a similar uh, experience. Yeah, that's just the best, isn't it? Like just finding ways to, to keep, keep playing, but, uh, you know, also pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So you're, a lot of your research is focused on white pines. So tell us about this group of pines there's lots of different species and where they are found throughout the world. The group of, of pines, colloquially known as white pines, um, are also known as five needle pines. And that refers to the fascicles. These are little bundles of needles um, that occur on pine branches. You can usually look at a pine and say, oh, this has a fascicle containing three needles or two needles, or this one's five needles. And just from that information, get pretty close to what the species is. So the five needle white pines are a group of species that originated in Asia, and they um, have a center of genetic diversity in that area of the world, and quite a lot of representatives also here in Western North America, where I am. So what differentiates these pines from others? Not only is the five needle element they also have some anatomical characteristics of their wood, which um, we don't necessarily need to get into, but a lot of anatomical differences that differentiate them. As far as my interests go, these white pines are really cool because they occur in really awesome areas like tops of mountains, widespread throughout the world, right north to south, latitudinal variation, east to west from Asia to Western North America. They're just kind of all over the place. And they... Uh, Again, give me an excuse to go to cool places to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now, another trait that these um, five needle white pines have is that they're all susceptible to um, a certain fungal disease that we call white pine blister rust. 
So what are the symptoms of that disease? Um, where is it found? And what are the mortality rates? So the symptoms of white pine blister us, um, which is a disease caused by the fungus Crenarchum rubicola, include cankering. So this is a proliferation of fungal tissue once it enters the tree and develops more and more biomass. It produces these cankers in the tree um, that end up looking like, like big tumors, sort of. And when they get wet, they turn kind of orangish. And so that's one reason that it's called rust, blister rust. Mm. Mm -hmm. well, any reason. So there are more like outward appearances of the tree that change after infection too. So branches will become bare of foliage um, or before they, they lose their foliage, they will just contain hold a bunch of brown foliage and we call that flagging. So if you're looking at a forest from like, you know, hundreds of yards back, you can see certain flagged branches out there and know exactly what tree to go look more closely at because there's probably something going wrong with it. And if it's a white pine in an area where blister rust occurs, it's quite possible that it was affected by the fungus. Depending on how old the tree is, that kind of determines the severity of the disease symptoms, right? Yeah, totally. So usually really young trees are, are not affected maybe until they're five to ten years old or, or a little older will they become infected and there are reasons for that i can get into momentarily larger trees are often affected at a higher rate and the way the fungus will affect the tree then is in strict nutrient flow through the phloem the, the bark of the tree creating these flagged areas so it, if the fungus successfully invades the tree enough that it's growing around the circumference of the trunk, then it, it can destroy the reproductive potential of that tree. Because pine trees, like a lot of conifers, produce their cones, their reproductive tissue occurs at the top. So if you take out the top of the tree, then that tree's not passing down its genetics. Why are young trees, really young trees, not susceptible to this fungus? Okay, the easiest way to think about that is to take on the perspective of the fungus itself. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to put on a little fungus hat and uh, maybe strap on a couple hyphal hairs to our backs and magic school bust this for a minute. Okay, are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. I got my Miss Prizzle dress on. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay, so these fungi spend a fair amount of time in the air in travel. They are obligate biotrophs, so they need to live on plants, the pines and their other hosts that we'll get into in a minute. Um, however, the way they get to those plants is by traveling on wind. They're blown around. And actually, they're blown around quite a distance. Um, one of their five spore stages can be blown up to 500 kilometers or so, most recent research shows. Um, so that, that's quite a distance, obviously. And if they right. are numerous, many, many spores produced on a pine, and those spores can blow around. And there's a good chance, just by, by chance alone, they're gonna find a hoax to land on and invade. Okay, so why do they um, tend to affect uh, younger versus older trees differently? It's just a spatial thing. They're more likely to blow onto a larger tree. Um, so that's, that's the main, main reason, okay. really. Um, if they happen to find themselves on a seedling, there's not necessarily any reason they might not be able to invade. Okay, so there's not like a um, ontogenal defense necessarily. It's just that you're there's less likelihood of being impacted by a spore if you're a tiny little shrimp tree versus a gigantic huge tree. That's right. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so the pines that you study are native to North America, but that's not where this fungus is native to. Um, tell us how that fungus got introduced to North America. Yeah, so that's a really interesting story. And to tell that story, I think it's also interesting to have a little background on the relationship of the fungus to the pines historically. So fungi live inside of all plants, pretty much. Um, the vast majority of plants harbor fungi inside their tissues. And it's not only foliage and not only bark, but really inside of every tissue. How did they get there? And how long have they been there? are some questions that we can think about. And as ecologists are trying to understand the interactions among things, including among diseases and things that produce diseases, 
it's uh, it gives us a broader, more interesting perspective, I think, to think about the fact that these fungi, Cronarsham rubicola, the white pine blister rust agent, um, is one of many fungi that these trees associate with. And so about 300 million years ago, when angiosperms diverged from gymnosperms, a uh, lineage of fungi also diverged. That's the, the fungal order Diaporthales and Helociales. And there are specialist fungi that associate more predominantly with angiosperms and gymnosperms now as a result. So exactly how this Cronarsham rubicola ended up developing a pathogenesis with these trees is up for question. We don't, we don't really know. Um, what we do know is that where that divergence occurred and the center of diversity of these pines in Asia, those trees, the white pines in Asia, are not as negatively affected by the fungi um, as they are in North America. And that's probably because somehow the fun fungus didn't occur in North America when the pines migrated um, and found themselves colonized North America. So that's, that's a curious reality. Okay, fast forward millions of years. These pines have been in North America for quite a long time without that particular fungus, without Cronarsham rubicola that causes white pine blister rust. Right, right, right. Okay. So the British found themselves very interested in American forests, um, largely because of Eastern white pines, very, very tall height, straight growth pattern, and the fact that Britain wanted to continue to be a major naval power in the world. So eastern white pine was a really attractive feature of the North American continent. Because they're going to make really good boats. Awesome boats. Britain can continue dominating and being imperialist, and that makes makes them happy, right? And they're... they're... Maybe not so many other people, but, you know, makes the Brits happy. Right. At the time, it was what they're after, you know, their, their ecological strategy, I guess. Okay, so... It was, it was well understood that these particular pine species were well sought after, you know, really highly sought after and, and would provide naval power. So in the 1700s, a dude named Lord Weymouth in Britain uh, had a ton of eastern white pine seeds brought over to Britain. And they planted them all over Europe. And they wanted to see where, if they could grow these trees to maximum proportion like they saw in, you know, Maine and New Hampshire and Connecticut and all over the place out there. As they're growing these trees, American foresters became increasingly interested in reforesting eastern white pine forests that they had cut down for their own lumber uses. So who was generating mm -hmm. a um, expertise in culturing or growing of these, these eastern pine seeds? It was actually the Europeans, not the Americans. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So um, just because of, you know, free trade and globalization and, you know, supply and demand, the Americans ended up finding that it was more economically efficient to import seedlings from the Europeans. So at this point, okay. the Americans were importing seedlings from Britain, Germany, and France, because all those countries had taken a large interest in Eastern White Pine. Now, unbeknownst to the American foresters that were importing millions and millions of seedlings annually to, for their reforestation needs here in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to them, a lot of these eastern white pines had been mingling with other types of white pines in Russia. And the exact way that this happened, no one really knows. But the thought is that maybe some Russian stone pine was brought over because it was pretty looking and planted over in eastern Germany or something where folks were culturing these eastern white pines and they mixed microbes. Okay. Okay. So like one of the trees essentially sneezed on the other one. Exactly. Yeah. Some big powerful if, tree. If you want to anthropomorphize it. Yeah. <laughs> Every time the wind <laughs> blows, a tree sneezes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it releases all these spores. And so there was a huge outbreak of white pine blister rust in Eastern Europe. And it became um, unsustainable to, to continue um, to plant those trees in that area. But for whatever reason, and this is, you got to kind of think of like, you know, if this was malicious intent or what, 
Um, the Europeans didn't seem to have many qualms transporting eastern uh, white pine seedlings to North America as the foresters asked for them. Whether or not they happen to have this blister rust or not. Right. And the fact that the blister rust doesn't really express itself often for a couple of years, it doesn't, you know, it's not like if you or I get a, a cold or a flu, you know, it's like, eh, we probably got it yesterday. I'm feeling like crap today and it's going to be this way for a little while. Um, but it's not going to necessarily just the virus or whatnot won't hang out in us for, you know, a year or two before producing a symptom like like some diseases will do in humans. But that is the case with white pine blister rust. So a lot of the seedlings that were coming over to North America were not showing symptoms. People were screening for um, for these things, most likely, but they wouldn't have seen them. Right. Yeah, so, so these look like normal, healthy seedlings. And so they're like, they want them. So here you go. And then, you know, the, the American foresters are planting these out. And then in a couple of years, they're like, oh, crap. Yeah, there was there was a big oh, crap moment in the eastern <laughs> U.S. And it actually took about 15, 20 years from that initial oh, crap moment in the northeastern U.S. until plant pathologists started thinking about you know, limiting their importation of seedlings and also getting a little more savvy about the life cycle of the fungus. Because as a plant pathologist, you need to understand the whole life cycle if you want to try to control a disease. Right. And this fungus has a crazy life cycle. Yeah. We're talking two different host plants, five different types of spores. It's insane. Totally. Yeah, it is a really wicked, awesome master of disguise. <laughs> so if we once again slip into the perspective of the microbe, take a microbe-centric view um, of its ecology, it'll help us understand why it has such a damn complicated life cycle. Okay, so let's like slip on our hyphae and get back into this. All right, back on the magic school yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. So yeah, let's say, you know, we have a couple requirements as any kind of organism plotting the earth, right? We, we need food and we need shelter. And if we are subject to the vicissitudes of another organism as our shelter, like we're living inside a plant is what I mean, then some periods of the year that plant may be more and less hospitable than other periods of that year. Sure. Yeah, a summer home and a winter yeah. home. No, that's a great way of thinking of it. <laughs> if we, as this microbe, are able to infect multiple species and we have multiple spore stages, and that means also ecological strategies with our own needs and level of metabolic needs, et cetera, then we're, we're essentially just spreading out our potential to succeed in the world. Like Just like any organism... These fungi just want to make as many copies of their DNA as possible. Right. And they've evolved this really complicated life cycle in order to do That's that. That's right. So let's say, you know, I, I need, oh, you know, macaroni and cheese to succeed. And that's the only thing I can eat. Now, I'd be pretty damn limited in my ability to succeed and pass down my genes, right? Like if all I could do was, was process macaroni and cheese. Now, if I can now be a vegetarian or carnivore or, you know, spread out and be all over the place, you know, just diversify my uh, metabolic requirements and also diversify the habitats that I can live in, then, oh my God, I am probably going to rock and be super fecund, right? Be extremely biologically fit. Excellent. All right. So you're a forester and you're trying to like manage this disease because that's a really valuable tree. It's important to understand the lie that this life cycle, even if it's complicated. So let's get on the magic school bus and let's kind of go through this a, a couple of years worth of um, fungal biology in a couple okay, of minutes. Sweet. Let's say these foresters see disease on the trees. Okay, they'll they'll see cankers um, exploding and, and oozing with spores, and then they're wondering, okay, what next? Where do these spores go? Okay, so if we're one of those spores and we just ooze out of a eastern white pine will be an esiospore, which is the smallest of the five spore stages. We can blow up to 500 kilometers at a gust and land on our next victim, which is going to be an angiosperm, actually. It could be one of, of three different angiosperm species. Well, genera, and actually a number of species within those. So that could be a, a ribes or, or um, uh, gooseberry, 
So, um, so that's a plant that will produce fruit that are pretty great to eat. It could be a paintbrush, Castileja genus, which occur at high elevations throughout Western North America and um, also in Asia, or a Pedicularis species, um, which is a really pretty little flower that also occurs at high elevations in Asia and Western North America. So all three of those plants are potential victims of the Esiospore. Once that Esiospore lands on one of these plants, it can reproduce and amplify its numbers through multiple spore stages on that one plant. So it'll usually land on one of those plants, like in the fall, and then over winter on those plants. And it may or may not distribute to the eastern white pine again and move back to its original phase by producing a basidia spore, a big clunky kind of spore that can only float a little bit of distance. So, so that's the general circle that the, the spores take. It has multiple spore stages on angiosperms and two spore stages on, on white pines. Excellent. And so it's important that, that we understand that there's that alternate host. It has to switch from the pine to the ribes or the other um, alternate hosts mm-hmm. in order to complete its full life cycle. So that provides an opportunity for foresters and land managers to control this fungus. Is that right? Well, yeah, perhaps. And that was, that was the thought early on when um, this disease was first recognized for its severity and potential danger to American forestry back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Once plant pathologists, biologists figured out this really wonky life cycle, they were like, oh, if we knock out the alternate host, we don't, you know, they don't necessarily care too much about, about the alternate host, the ribes, pedicularis, um, lousewort, or the castileja paintbrush plants. You know, they're pretty plants, but they're not using them for timber. So if they could just get rid of those, maybe they would preserve their timber industry, right? That was it. Right. So um, they, lots and lots of people were deployed across the continent to just rip Ryby's plants out of the ground. Because at this point, we need to remember that it wasn't known that there are multiple alternate hosts. Folks only were aware of Ryby. Right. So it turns out Ryby's grows across North America, just everywhere you can bloody imagine, you know, like <laughs> on mountaintops and valleys, just all over the place. There's a tons of different species. A lot of them are, well, quite a few of them are susceptible to the rust and can harbor them. So wave after wave of thousands of humans were sent out into the wilds to yank these plants out of the ground. And this cost millions of dollars um, from the Forest Service, uh, so from the American government. And after the course of, of years and years of doing this, it became apparent that there's just no way they were going to take all the varieties out of the earth. <laughs> Right. What do foresters do to manage this disease? Yeah. So what they have done, try to eradicate it from just removal of its hosts, you know, was recognized that it just wasn't going to work. And actually where it has been done consistently for upwards of 70 years, like in Maine, a certain area of Maine, folks, folks realized that the infection rate dropped from a, a little less than 10% with the ribes to more like four percent or so without any ribes so it wasn't like major gains anyways so yeah folks started moving on and looking at other ways of controlling this disease there was some work in the i want to say 40s or 50s looking at interactions of microbes inside of the bark and there was a thought that some microbes were antagonistic of carnarshan labicola so maybe we could plot microbe against microbe Mm. right that was something that folks looked at for a while. And actually, one thing that I, this is the question that got me interested in, in uh, white pine blister rust, is looking into that microbial ecology, seeing how they act with uh, fellow bee fungi. And what I found through that work was that there were not consistent fungal associates of diseased and non-diseased trees. So we're, you know, the jury's still a little out. I think more studies need to be done to know whether or not that's, you know, the be all end all. We're not going to be able to move forward with controlling the disease through microbiome manipulation. But so far, I am not extremely optimistic about that approach. One long-standing approach is tree improvement. And so that just means going out into the woods, finding the trees in a patch of diseased trees. Uh, There will be maybe a few that are not diseased. And we think as biologists, 
what's going on there? Is there some kind of genetic resistance to this in that particular tree? So we can collect seeds from that tree, grow them up in a nursery, do a controlled inoculation. Uh, that means, you know, just infect the tree um, with or seedlings, uh, progeny of that, that tree with the um, fungal pathogen and see if the progeny are also resistant. In which case we would say, wow, there's probably a genetic pattern to this because, you know, the mom tree had it, the children tree had it, that itself is heritability. Okay, sweet. Maybe we can, you know, make a bunch of these seeds, bring them out into the wilds, and increase the number of um, genetically res resistant trees out there. Yeah, that seems like a really good strategy. Use the natural resistance mm -hmm. um, against the fungus because there are, we know that there is a genetic component because the trees that evolved with this fungus back in Asia, they don't really show the same types or, or the severity of these disease symptoms like the naive white pines do in North America. Exactly. Yeah, so that is a major indicator that there is a genetic component to resistance versus susceptibility. And, you know, it, it also... It should make us wonder if we didn't tinker with the system at all, would that same resistance evolve here in the U.S. or in Canada? Right. Yeah, that makes sense because, you know, this is an evolutionary pressure. Trees that are highly susceptible to it can't reproduce as well as the ones that are more resistant to it. So you would think that those genes would happen to just, you know, find the process of natural selection. Those trees would become more common on the landscape. Now, we would hope. I mean, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that um, western white pine are 90% susceptible, and there's a 90% mortality rate among western white pine, which is a really, you know, was at one point a really important timber species in the northwest. So if we were to let evolution just take its course and see if the forests in North America became resistant, like those um, those forests in Asia, we we might risk losing species altogether. So is that a risk we're willing to take? You know, it's it. for sure. Yeah, you know, and it makes sense if if we have the knowledge to do artificial selection and speed up this evolutionary process. Why not? Mm -hmm. That's the thinking. You know, there's lots of different species of white pines. Species in the West tend to have these really large seeds. Um, that are animal dispersed, so birds and squirrels, and will cast these seeds. Whereas in the east, the seeds are just dispersed by the wind. So the southwestern white pines that we have in uh, northern Mexico and southwestern U.S., if we lose those trees, the cascading ecological effects might be more severe than if we lose um, white pines in the east. Because of that animal distribution of seeds. Right, yeah. You know, southwestern white pines are considered to be a foundation species where all these other animals are dependent on these as a food source. Yeah. So if we lose those, there's a huge ripple effect into the rest of the ecosystem. Right. So this, this gets into a really interesting, you know, in the more complicated kind of issues that conservation biologists um, need to think about. So Let's say in a perfect world, we're able to control the environment perfectly, like it's some finely engineered system. Can we think of consequences for eliminating the rust disease that, you know, might be negative consequences? And then compare those consequences to what might happen if the rust disease totally knocks out a crucial species such as southwestern white pine, or white bark pine, which is a keystone species due to its unique provision of proteins in high elevation environments. You know, so there, there's kind of an interplay of cost benefits here. And in Asia, you know, we, we can only surmise at this point changes in the white pines that relate to selection for genetic resistance to blister rust. You know, so that resistance is going to come with a ton of baggage. There are a couple kinds of resistance. One is major gene, that'd be like a dominant form of resistance, and then polygenic resistance. And polygenic resistance is many, many genes acting together in order to, or with the consequence of providing some sort of resistance or tolerance to the disease. And given that there are a bunch of genes interacting, those genes probably also influence other traits of, of the trees. 
So this is where the story gets really complicated and interesting. Yet, uh, yet another level of complication is if we were to eliminate the, the disease altogether, how does that change the long-term trajectory of a white pine population's evolution? Yeah, that's a really interesting thing that I hadn't really considered because one gene might code for several different traits. Right. And it often does. Um, mm -hmm. Not always, but often. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we're seeing that if we start tugging on you know, one element of a species ecology, uh, we start potentially tinkering with all kinds of other elements that we didn't intend to mess with. It sounds really complicated. <laughs> you're, you're right, though, to say that, you know, if we were to lose southwestern white pine or or let's say even more crucially, the, the keystone um, white bark pine mm -hmm. from high elevation ecosystems. Yeah, what then of the Clark's nutcracker bird, which is an obligate seed disperser for white bark pine? It gets a lot of its, its nutrients from its seeds. Bear feed heavily on um, both southwestern white pine, white bark pine, limber pine as well, and rodents, lots of ground squirrel species, various, various species of rodents also get a lot of nutrients from them too. So yeah, these cascading effects are yet another WTF biology. Why'd you have to make things so hard on us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it be great if I, ecology was simple? Yeah, kind of, but I don't think I'd do it then, you know? I'd go, yeah, yeah I'd get bored. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I like it because it's complicated. Okay, so I have two more questions for you. The first question is, is there a scientist, either well-known or lesser known, that has changed how you approach biology or science in general? Yeah, hands down, Rachel Carson, author of Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. He's my science hero, intellectual hero, I guess I'll say. I, I feel that all too often scientists um, decline to speak out against um, or speak out for ethical issues. And she was fearless in that regard, um, where she uh, readily talked about implications of um, certain technologies that scientists are development for the natural environment, right? What's their effect going to be on the world as we know it? So yeah, Rachel Carson is a rock star, was a rock star, RIP. She is an, an amazing person. Okay, and then um, the last thing that I have for you is that where can people find you on the social media? Yeah, find me on ResearchGate. That is the best place. You can also drop me a message on ResearchGate and find my research um, right there, stored on, on the website. Google Scholar is another way to connect. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd love it if you ask me any questions you might have about what we talked about today or about my, my research um, anytime. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Julia. I really appreciate the opportunity. While doing some fact-checking, I discovered that Lord George Weymouth returned Pinus strobus seeds to Europe in the 17th century, not the 1700s. Weymouth's ship returned bearing eastern white pine seeds in 1605 after a bunch of all-too-common colonialist activities, including kidnapping and torturing indigenous people, of what is now Canada and the U.S. Pinus strobus is known as eastern white pine in the United States and Canada, and that's what Aaron and I refer to it as, but it's also known as the Weymouth pine in Europe. I've added some links in the show notes, including a great diagram of the complex life cycle of the causal agent of white pine blister rust, Conortium rubicola. There you can get all nerdy about life cycles and how the understanding the basic biology of an organism is important for effective management. There's also a great YouTube video from the University of Wyoming that covers the life cycle, but also shows the flagging that Aaron was talking about. In the show notes, you'll also find links to Aaron's ResearchGate profile. Well, that's it for the first ever episode of What the Fuck Biology. A big thanks to my guest, Dr. Aaron Muller, who was very patient as we worked through some technical difficulties. A special thanks to Dr. Ron Deckert, who provided the awesome music. The show was written and edited by me, Julia Hull. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Tell your friends, family, and coworkers to give it a listen, too. You can find What the Fuck Biology podcast at WTF underscore biology on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you know of a what the fucky aspect of biology or ecosystem that you would like covered on the show, drop me a line at WTFbiology at gmail.com. Be sure to join me again in two weeks. On January 20th, I'll have a special episode called What the Fuck Biologist, where I examine the life and influence of Rachel Carson, Aaron's intellectual hero.